Susie, 1935, Dallas, Texas. Wow. Let's go back to when you were a little girl. What do you remember just growing up? Okay, remembering growing up, this is the cutest thing. Um, I would have to take you back to the family, though. My grandma and grandpa, Katie and Morris Rosen, they lived on San Jacinto, and I believe the house is still there at Hall and Ross, the next street over where my daddy's store, mother's store was, the little dry goods store, everything $1.99. We lived at there at uh, San Jacinto, right there in Hall. And one block up was San Jacinto, it was the St. Paul Hospital where I was born. I had my grandma and grandpa, Katie and Morris Rosen, had everybody over every Sunday. My mother and daddy and I lived with them the first six years of my life. So here comes my mother's five sisters and their husbands and their children. Here comes my mother's brother and his wife and their children on Sundays. And I remember all of them over. Grandma always loved to cook, and she would have everybody there. We'd have the meals there. And my Uncle Archie, just, there was only one brother, and he just loved me. He just adored me. And so he brought me a little tricycle. And so all the little kids then would all get on that little tricycle, come over on Sunday and ride up and down the sidewalk and whatever. So much fun. We have all those wonderful memories. Well, that has stayed so close. That family has really been inseparable. And this is the thing that's so neat about it. When there is a bar mitzvah or a wedding or a bat mitzvah or a bris, a baby naming, whatever there is, we don't have to call and say, are you going? Will you be in Houston? Will you be in Atlanta? Most of us are here in Dallas. We know all of us will be there. So we all come and meet and enjoy one another. A huge crowd, a huge crowd. Made 19 first cousins out of this. So I will explain that all to you later. So while you see we're all at each function and all so close. So we don't have to call each other every day or every week or whatever to stay up. But we are up on each other, their families, and what's going on, you know, in the main events. Now, what, what did your dad do for a living? My dad was in that dry good business. This is the cutest thing you ever heard of. Everything about dollar ninety nine, maybe two ninety nine, little dry good store. All the people there, uh, they got their paychecks every uh, every Friday. So they come across the street to this little bitty store of little socks and shoes and little people's clothes and grown-ups' clothes and everything, but real inexpensive little thing. And they didn't have much money. They would come with their little paycheck, and Mother and Daddy would cash it. And uh, they'd say, well, I got maybe uh, $10 to spend this Friday. And Mother said, well, do you need any panties for your little kid? Yes, I could use a few pair of panties for my little kid. And maybe do you need a dress for Sunday school for your daughter? Yes, I could use a little dress. The reason I'm telling you this, if they waved a $10 bill and said that's what they wanted to spend before they got out of that store, they spent, they spent that 10 If they had a 20 if they had a 5 whatever it was, it's just over. She was the greatest. She was known, my mother, Sadie Weissman, as the greatest saleswoman of all time. That's where my brother, my sister, and I get it all from. We're all in sales. Love it. Live it. It's a part of our, it's just in our genes. My grandfather had that store. They went in and took it over. And, uh, then uh, they said, well, we want to send our three kids to college. That was their mission in life, my mother and daddy. Don't you know they sent us three kids to college? Not only on that little store where they made it, but daddy had a uh, used car lot. He was way before the used car lots that are up and down Ross Avenue now for years and years and years. But he had that. He had other investments, and he made it, and he sent my, me to Texas University. He sent my brother to Texas University. He sent my sister to Oklahoma University. We all made it. Wonderful education. Bright, bright, bright children. Uh, straight A, straight A pluses. We all made it. What was the name of the Dragon store. So he called it the little, the little New Yorker. There was another dragon store right across the street from him. But uh, it was just a little bitty thing, not like a department store or anything. Right. Now, you were born, um, you know, uh, during the Depression time. Do you know, did it affect your family, the Great Depression? I think it affected us very much. We, uh, we didn't have a lot. We were happy and satisfied, you know, night well-dressed kids, went to school, had to study. That was very important. Made excellent grades, very bright, and uh, uh, straight A's, straight A pluses. We didn't have a lot of stuff, but we were very, very happy. You went to school, you studied, you came home, had your meals, you had your family, you went to bed, you got up, you went to Sunday school Sunday. It was just not like it is now. So you know? what, what was it that you and your brother Herb and your sister Maxine, what, what did you guys used to do that if your parents found out you just would have died. Not very much. Okay, I'm going to tell you why. You're good, huh? I was absolutely so controlled and so 
They watched over me like a hawk. They, that was the first sweetheart of Henry Monsky, AZA, 60 boys. I was not allowed to date the same boy two nights in a row. So because you had 60 that are calling you at different times to go to this dance, to this movie, to this dinner, to this party. So you can understand how fortunate I was. The boys would say when they brought you home for the day, what is that light flickering on the front porch? I said, oh my God, that's my mother saying, you need to bring me in right now. You can't sit out here in a parked car with me. They would run you up to that front door so fast, give you a peck on the cheek, and get back in their car. What did your grandfather do? He was a shoe cobbler. Okay. When he came over from Warsaw, Poland, he, uh, they told me he came over from um, Ellis Island, came over through Ellis Island, and he oh, was a cobbler in New York. He wasn't making any money, so he came down with the, when Spindle Top came on down through Beaumont and then ended up in Dallas, and he ended up with that little dry goods store that his parents, I think, had that. He took it over, then my mother and daddy went into that business. My mother always worked. Tell me about your grandfather. You know, he was going, he went into the Russian Army. He went into the Russian Army, right. They sent him off into the Army. Uh, my cousin told me that he, they actually fed him dog meat when he realized that he deserted. He deserted. Uh, he had met his wife, Katie. It was matched up. It was right. a matched thing. She was 15. He was 18. She actually met him on her wedding day. She had never met him or seen him before. She got pregnant on her wedding night. And then nine months later, he saw that she had, she had child my Aunt Molly. And Aunt Molly looked exactly like him. So he knew it was not, it was his child. It belonged to him. It was not any messing around, you know. <laughs> How did they come over together then? No, they did not come over together. He came over and then uh, they said, if things were okay in New York, if he could make it, he would send for her and Aunt Molly. And that's what he finally did. That's how they finally got them over there to, to New York. And then they came, of course, with the child. She came with that child, Aunt Molly. Yeah. And Aunt Molly lived in New York. The rest of them came on down and were the families in Dallas. Your grandparents on the other side. My grandparents on the other side, uh, Max and Dora Weitzman, my daddy's parents, uh, they came down uh, through, uh, daddy was born in Lutz, Poland, came here when he was five years old, speak perfect English. He doesn't remember any of that, because he was already, you know, so little. And uh, his parents were born in uh, Poland, and uh, they came down through Wichita Falls, your Borger, and the oil business there in Borger. And uh, that's how that's how they made their money. They had more money than Katie and Morris uh, Rose. Now, the, uh, do you know when it was that they came? O everybody came over. Grandma and Grandpa's name was Morris and Katie Rosen. Grandpa's Hebrew name was Moshe, uh, for Moses, but he went by M. Rosen. He was born in 1870 in Warsaw, Poland. He found his, he has found his ancestry all the way back to 1600. He married Katie at 18, and Katie was 15, in 1888, and they were matched up together. Morris's father was Meyer Rosen, born in Warsaw, Poland. Morris's mother was Anna Rosen, born in Warsaw, Poland. Katie's maiden name was Tumbach. Katie's father was Ariel Tumbach. Katie's mother was Minnie Ka Tombaugh, born April 15, 1873. Grandma Katie was an orphan. Her family died of influenza, and Anne and Uncle raised her. She met Grandpa on the day of her marriage in 1888. Grandpa then went into the Russian army and he did desert him. Grandpa was not doing well in Poland, came through Ellis Island. He came to New York in late 1800, early 1900s, and sent for Grandma and Molly. Molly was born in Warsaw in 1889. She was 13 years older than the next child, Aunt Minnie. And there were five daughters and one son. Grandma and Grandpa had two kids in New York, Minnie and Archie, the boy, lived in the Lower East Side. Grandpa was a shoe cobbler. They had a third child, a boy who died on the train ride when they left New York. When Spindletop came in to Texas and all was discovered, they came on down. Aunt Molly married Solomon at 16 years old. They had two kids, Barney and Pearl. The family got to Beaumont, Texas in 1903 and had three more children. Aunt Lenora, my mother Sadie, Rosen, Weitzman, and my Aunt Etta. They moved to Dallas in 1920. They had the ready-to-wear store in Beaumont and made a living there. The store was called originally M. Rosen, my grandfather's name, M. Rosen and Son.
moved to Dallas on San Jacinto Street, one block from San Paul Hospital where I was born, and their dry goods store was one block where most things I told you were $1.99 and $2.99. Their customers mainly from the African Americans across the street at Fishman Cleaners. My mother worked for her dad in the store. She worked every day of her life. When she sent us to school, she went to work, came home in time to have dinner for all of us, all of us at the table together every night. All had to be well dressed at the table. My dad never let you come to the table in shorts or with the bra sticking out or in a gown and robe. You had to be decent and respectable. Right. Okay. Dad was from Richard Todd Falls, then went to Barger, Texas, where the all was. He would come to Dallas on weekends, met my mother, and fell in love. Grandma loved to cook and always had open house. I had visitors over for a meal to meet the family. Dad came in to Grandpa's business with my mother. My dad also had used car lots on Ross Avenue and other investments. Morris, my grandfather, died on November 1942. The 12th Akash Van observed on Tuesday, November 4th. He died at 72 years old. Katie died January 1951. She was 78 years old. She was in a boarding home on Gaston Avenue. She was a diabetic and she had lost her leg. They had already cut off her one leg. They were members of Sherith Israel Synagogue all their life. She, he was a Gabbai that was stood up on the bima there when they were reading from the Torah. My grandfather was. The Shul, uh, Sherith Israel, honored Grandma and Grandpa for 50 years of marriage in 1938. They got married in, in 1888. The, all, the family always had a good name. That's the most important thing in the Jewish religion, that you come out of this with a good name. The whole family came out with a good name. Molly had two kids. Minnie had four kids. Lenore had two girls. Uh, Sadie, my mother, had three children, two girls and a boy. And Etta had uh, two girls and a boy. There's 19 <laughs> first cousins. My mother died at age 99. My dad died at 81. My mother and daddy, they called George Burns and Gracie Allen. My daddy teased and teased and joked and teased. He was about five, three, or four, believe me. My mother never made five feet, so you can see how adorable they were. Little Dresden doll, my mother, always dressed to the nines, just immaculate hair at the beauty shop, flipped up, solid white hair, always flipped, just beautiful face, beautiful little bitty body, just exactly like mine. I mean, she just, no extra weight, never fat, never and uh, always in high heels, and him. So two little bitty people, and he's teasing her all the time. And she'd say, Louie, Louie, stop that. He, he called her Gracie for Gracie Allen. Her name is Sadie, Sadie, in front of anybody. Gracie, stop it, Louie. Just stop it. People think you're going to believe that. They're going to believe you. <laughs> and of course, they didn't believe him. They knew he was kidding all the time. It just was so cute. Then in the store, I have to tell you that people would come in for fishman uh, cleaners every Friday, and so... They come and say, well, I, I need a bra. And uh, Daddy, you know, would be there till Mother got there a little later after she got us off to school and got everything, you know, set up in the house. And he'd say, well, do you want single-breasted or double-breasted? <laughs> and my dad, those customers would let me. They have never heard of that in their life. Daddy, how could you? He would just, he just joked all the time. I just had to tell you that because they had some cute little thing where little bitty people didn't know anything, didn't have wonderful education. Daddy didn't finish high school. It's just adorable. Mother was just priceless. She'd march around at 90 years old at uh, North Park. She lived at University Park at Lover's Lane and Preston Road, 70 years in that home. She'd go to North Park and she'd march around in those high heels four times every day, four times around the mall. She's marching every day around, every day for her and they're yelling out from Dillard's, from Macy's, from Neiman's, from whatever. Sadie, who's they find? Sadie, hi, Sadie, hi. They do it for every day for so many years. The different workers. Hi, Sadie, how you doing? I see you're doing your exercise today. She was known all over that mall at every one of those department stores, which is adorable. At that age, that that woman, now you see where the exercise comes from. You know, I get it from her that she was in such good shape and lived to 99. That's pretty good, you know. I have one brother, Herb Weissman. Herb is married. Uh, he had his first wife, um, Jeannie Weissman. Married to her 44 years, and she had uh, sarcoma cancer and uh, died, had 12 operations up in MD Anderson. My brother is on the board of MD Anderson at, as we speak. And uh, after he, uh, she died, after 44 years, three years later, he met and was introduced to this Donna Arp Weissman, who was the mayor of Colleyville. 
from Harvard University, just an absolute doll, a model, a living doll. We get along like sisters. We're sister-in-laws. She calls me every day to see what I'm doing and vice versa. She just wrote a book. Just an outstanding woman, just brilliant and uh, a love down to earth. And uh, they're very, very happy. They're out every night doing something exciting. The Maverick game, they're all over every show, musical, just like me, Broadway show, whatever. They're just happy, contented, love the same things, and I'm just so thrilled and pleased that my brother's found someone that has the same interests he has. My brother has uh, two married daughters, and uh, he has four granddaughters. I have one sister, Maxine Grablowski. Um, Spohn, S-P-O-H-N, lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Sister Maxine has two grown children in Atlanta, but they have no, no, uh, they're not married, neither one. Okay, I had four children. Uh, Lucy Mazel from pan Pancreatic Cancer. Right. Rochelle is in Dallas and is a personal trainer. Uh, Barry Kay, married in Boulder, Colorado to Tab. She teaches yoga. She also has her own jewelry business on the internet. Busy body, she just like her mother, does something all day long, busy and doing something. Never stops. She is a Dresden doll. She is a living doll. She's just wonderful. Very bright little girl, too. Uh, she has two children, Shane, 22, that is at the University of Colorado. And Travis is now a year, uh, semester abroad uh, over in Europe. And he's at Den Denver College. Okay, that's two of my grandchildren. Baron is married, lives in Dallas, has three grown boys. Twin boys, Austin and Bronson. They're 21 years old. They're adorable. Austin, this is a good way to remember it, is in Austin, Texas, at the University of Texas, taking architecture. Bronson, first time they've separated the twins. Bronson is at Pratt University in New York, and he's taking design. They're all artistic kids. Their little boy just turned 18, and he's also artistic. And he's at Booker T. Washington in Dallas. Baron, his dad, Fred Ablin, gave him the saw building business. It is a type of fertilizer that you put on golf courses or on yards but other than a wonderful father and a wonderful husband he was a top athlete at a and he was the leading hitter on the Aggie team for baseball he was all Southwest Conference baseball player uh, when he had to go to the service Eglin Air Force Base in the service for three years. They sent him there for baseball. That's why he was sent to Eglin, and he played on the baseball team there. Every afternoon we got through with that, he went and played with the golfers, the pros, and learned golf, learned golf. By the time he left there in three years, he was the champion at Eglin Air Force Base. Came to Dallas, was the champion of our country club, 27 years in a row, undefeated in golf. Uh, he was the Dallas City champion singles in golf, Dallas City champion in doubles in golf, unbelievable athlete, the best Jewish athlete in Dallas. So when I got divorced, I said to people, I don't see you don't eat chicken anymore. You don't order it on re in restaurants. You go out all the time and you're eating out all the time. You never order chicken. I said, when I divorced Freddie Avalon in the poultry business, I divorced chicken. I don't eat chicken anymore. He brought me home chicken every night. It was free from the poultry plant. And I had to, I never cooked my recipes and I had to figure out how to season it, how to make it, dream up, how to make it with my vegetables, my potatoes, my whatever, my salad for my family every night, just about, literally. So I don't eat chicken. It was an uncontested divorce. I was very uh, blessed to have that just two months. Nothing to argue about. We didn't have anything. Nothing to fight over. Two very nice people who just, I don't know if you outgrew one another, just couldn't make it. It was best for both of us. It was a mutual agreement. And uh, life after that was, well, what was I going to do to, uh, I knew I could sell. I'd worked for a little card shop, so I knew I could sell a card shop in Preston Royal. And did very well meeting the public, you know, never had a problem, you know, greeting people. And, and uh, with my winning ways, I did have that. So uh, a wonderful personality. I always had that and I was always noted for that and uh, so uh, I said well I'll see what I can do so I went to Walls Catering and I asked them did they need any help and I would be very good in sales and they said well we'll try you out we'll see what you can do and of course I could put parties together very nicely you know and uh, uh, make the money for them of course and they gave me a salary and uh, the interesting th part about them was uh, they said to me well I'll put you on commission if you can sell so well we'll put you out in the city let you go to these buildings you choose to go to in these different communities and uh, see what you can do and so I went to these communities and first building I sold for ten thousand dollars you know worth of catering and I came back to him and said I have a big party that I need y'all to do you know do all the food and all and um, the next one I did that same week in that same building 
told them that I had gotten a $10,000 party uh, in, the, in this building. And uh, did they have anything they needed? Said, yes, we're thinking about an open house. And uh, got a $5,000 building party for them. Took it back to my boss. He says, oh, I just cannot afford to pay you that kind of commission. Uh, that's just too much money to give you. And I said, you're kidding. I'm making all this money for you, and you cannot see that you need to be giving me my commission that you had promised me? And so, uh, oh, no, I just have to put you on salary. have to pull that back down and whatever. So uh, very interesting, you know, how people do things and see things. You know, I could see that I was very, very good at it. But anyway, I had stayed at Walls Catering, which was a big catering here in Dallas, uh, Royal Lane in Preston Road. I was there 12 years, selling, 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 made a name for myself, a very good name. The day I left, as they continued to go down, as, as they rode up, I rode them up. As they came down, I decided to leave, and that community, a very small community, hears about each other, and I have never been uh, let go from a company, okay? And you can imagine that. So they heard about me. The very next day, I got a phone call from Ruth Goodman, from Goodies from Goodman. She said, Susie, heard you left. Uh, Walls Catering. I said, yes, I did. And she said, I'd like you to come visit with Bobby and Chuck Goodman, my sons. Could you come over Thursday? And I said, be happy to. You know, didn't know what that would develop into. Went over and visited with the two boys, young boys. And of course, they hired me. And I did their catering for them. And I was with them 12 years. And did the same type of thing. You know, put the parties together. Very simple for me. Fun type of thing. Nothing, you know, the saddest thing you did is maybe a condolence tray. Maybe, you know, you had to do that. But otherwise, it was more parties, you know. So luncheons and weddings and bar mitzvahs and boss mitzvahs and brisses. And it just was always fun. And so I loved it. And I exemplified that, you know. So I was there 12 years. And then when I left them, uh, the next day... <laughs> A catering by Arthur called me and said, I heard you left. And I said, yes, I did. He said, I'd like you to come talk to me. Lowell Michelson, kosher catering. Knew nothing about kosher catering. Didn't have to know. Just here's what I need you to put together, what I need you to sell. You're a great saleswoman. And you know everybody in town. Yes, I do. And you have a way about you uh, that, that works. And so I was with him 11 years doing that for him. And when I left, I said, total 35 years. And so I thought I should call it a day. And the cutest thing about it is I got a phone call from Sue Collager from her Spice of Life. And they're the biggest right now. It's just wonderful. And she called and said, Susie, I heard you left. I've known her all my life. And she said, please, you know everybody. And you're so good. Please come to work for us. And I said, Sue, is 35 years enough? She said, oh, my God, have you been in catering 35 years? And I said, yes. And she said, yes, I think that is enough. She could, say, she could agree with that, you know. So that was my career. Made the money, not a lot of money, but that's how I took care of my four children. Got them whatever I could give them that they, that they needed, not a lot, but was home when they got home from school and was there for them and see that they had, you know, got their grades and that they ate, had a good meal, took care of four, all two years apart, loving family and devoted, and I loved them dearly, and they knew, they knew that. Every summer, our parents took us, all the, their sisters, their children, their, ch their grandchildren, everybody, to Galveston. We went to Galveston. We would call when we were in AZA and BBG, an organization. We would call Houston and tell all of our friends in AZA and BBG, tell the ones in Galveston who belonged, and they would all come down the week we were there. We all went for a week, and Dad would put in the bill in his uh, store, gone fishing, so that people would think he really went fishing, not that he was on vacation, you know. And we would all be down there. God knows how many of us on the beach at the Buccaneer and Galvez Hotel. They would take us to the amusement park, take us to the Melanie's uh, room for us. Uh, uh, dinner and of course they gambled there and we would go there for dancing and it was just the the loveliest uh, most fun time in the world just one week you know we did that every summer so that that we look forward to and then the next thing I did when that was all over and not done anymore divorce I would take my children alone all four and their husbands and the grandchildren so I take 12 13 or 14 of course I lost myself so that's when the time the amount came down to Destin, Florida, every summer for a vacation for one week. And you say, how could you do it, Susie? Well, I have a girlfriend, and when we were in the service there for three years, Joanne and Warren Gorley that were stationed there, they built, they had bought a condominium there. 
they built a hotel there right next to it that juts off into the ocean. So when I would call her and say I was coming, she said, Susie, I'll give you your room free, a thousand dollar room free, because I had such a big expense. And of course, uh, Rochelle and Barry Kay would stay in the same room and the Baron, you know, would have a separate room and I would pay for them and then get my room free and make it a little more appealing, you know, and I go down there for a week and take the kids and they look forward to that. I don't have to tell you. So I take all the family and their kids, grandchildren, and we go for a week. It was just fabulous. So I've tried to make it a very, very nice event, a very nice happening, uh, a very good family and try to keep them all together as best I could. Where'd you go to high school? Okay, Highland Park High School at number one high school in Dallas. When you graduated, straight A or A+. Plus mostly A+. Plus. When I graduated Highland Park High School, you could go to any college in the, in the United States. That's the rating we had from Highland Park High School. Mother and Daddy watched over you, thought I was the princess, thought I was the queen, everything they ever wanted from me, the best answer of all the crowd, I was that. They wanted me to be the most popular girl in all the crowd, I was that. The best grades of anyone that they knew, I was that. Sweet and, and never met a stranger, I was that. A lovely smile, always told everyone hello, I was that. I was everything they ever wanted that they had, my mother had ever hoped to be, and I, I achieved that. So when they gave me the choice, and they said, well, we'd like you to stay around here and go to SMU. They didn't want me out of their sight. Well, maybe Massachusetts, can I go someplace? Well, maybe we'll think about it. Maybe Texas University. I didn't run. I, didn't run. I jumped to go to Texas University in Austin, and that's where I went. Loved it. I loved Highland Park High School because it was fun, good grades, wonderful friends. Where did wonderful you meet kids. Fred? Fred, I met him through AZA, through AZA. He in was from school, Fort Worth. Uh -huh. uh, yes, in high school, about 13, 14 years old. He used to come over. He lived in Fort Worth, and he'd come over to the AZA parties that I was sweetheart of. And he was the president of his little AZA group in, in Fort Worth. And he always liked me, always adored me. And this is the thing I knew about Fred. All those guys that asked me to all those parties, they'd have to ask you way down the line. Two months down the line, Susie, will you go to this dance with me? And three months down the line, will you go to this one's birthday party with me? Had to ask you down the line because 60 boys always trying to get their weekends in. You couldn't go out during the week, you know, during school. But Freddie, I always knew about Freddie. If he was ever at a dance, a Sweet 16 dance or anything with anybody else, any other girl, he had always asked me first. So I always knew that, that how much he, you know, he really, really, really liked me. He'd always try to get there first. But of course, you guys stayed through high school? They did all through high school, absolutely. And I married at uh, at 19, and he was 20. And But I never went steady with him. Never went steady, allowed to go steady with anybody. Never allowed to go two nights in a row with him. And he knew that, you know. But he's always trying to get in there. And uh, he would come in from A&M uh, on some weekends when he could finally get in and come in for a Friday night or Saturday night at, at Texas University and take me out, you know. And I tell you how... It was really strange how he happened to propose. I thought this was really strange. I was dating another boy of uh, Texas University, Bernard Cass, a brand new car and everything. And he was El Paso. He was from El Paso. He was coming in to see me. Susie, I'm coming in to see you for this holiday and take you out. And we had the date and everything. And he had a car accident. And he rolled the car over and he was in terrible shape. And his brother called me from El Paso and said, Susie, Bernard can't make it. He's been in a terrible accident. He's all taped up. He's in the hospital. Don't know how long. I want to tell you. And I was just heart sick. I mean, somebody coming to see me and a dear friend, and he's in terrible shape. So I said to my daddy, Daddy, you know, I told you Bernard's coming in to see me. He's going to date him here in Dallas. He's in the hospital, and he's not well. And can I please, can you please fly me to El Paso? Let me go there. I'm sure his folks will pick me. I'll call his brother, and I'm sure they'll put me up for the night or the weekend. And I'll see how he is. I don't know if he'll recognize me or know me. I'll feel better if I see him. I just feel so bad, you know, that that happened to a friend of mine. Okay, he'll let me go. So Freddie heard that I was going to El Paso to see Bernard. So there must be something going on. The minute I got back to Dallas, not the second, no, no, not the minute. The second I got back to Dallas, Freddie was there and says, I want you to marry me. He knew there was something up. If I would go see a boy or my folks would let me go see a boy in another town. Right. So he proposed, well, we'd been friends, you know, many, many years. And he was always lovely and wonderful to me. I always knew he liked me. And so I said, well, okay. And I married him his senior year at A&M, the last part of the semester. Loved A&M. Here's Queen B at A&M. And uh, I worked on the student activities office for Spike White. We had known him through his mother-in-law lived next door to us on Amherst. 
where we where I grew up. Now that's a small world too. And Spike was head of the student activities office there, and he hired me, of course, and I worked there. And Freddie played golf there and studied there, went to school there, and so I loved it there because it was just in belonged to Hillel there and had all the boys over for dinner, the Hillel boys, different ones, different weekends. I would cook and have them in, and I loved to cook. So I really had a good time there. It was a fun, fun time at AM. Had a little house there, a little two bedroom house, and it was the most enjoyable. I didn't have any kids there. We went on to Eglin Air Force Base, and that's where I had two. Yeah. That's where I had Miss Ellen Rochelle. That was uh, Freddie in the service? Freddie was three three years in the, uh, yes, in the service. Uh -huh. He was a second lieutenant, went in a second lieutenant. I told you, played baseball for the general. Right. That's how he got sent there. And then... Uh, was there a war going on at the time he was in the service? No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no, no, but he was going to be sent to Alaska remote, mm -hmm. unless you could say the only ones that weren't sent, that whole class, from Eglin, unless you could say you were at least seven months pregnant. <laughs> You're not going to believe this one. And the doctor told me, you're seven months pregnant, and he did not have to go. Oh, wow. So we got to stay there. I mean, isn't that interesting things in your life that just happened to fall in place? What was the happiest time in your life? Happiest time of my, I've been a happy girl. I've been a real happy, the unhappiest time of my life. So let me, let me go from there. Losing the child is the worst. You would think the divorce was the worst. It was an uncontested divorce. It took two months, and that's all. So it was not unhappy. And we remained best friends, Freddie and I. were still best friends. So... That was the worst of the rest of my time. Was very, very school, very, very good. Could meet all my mother's expectations. High school, very, very excellent, excellent. Being sweetheart and all of that, outstanding. High school, college, uh, more than outstanding. Uh, sorority, Sigma Delta Tau, all those boys I dated. Uh, in, uh, uh, always had a dance, date every weekend to all the fraternity parties. They always saw was there, was the best dancer, one of the best dancers. So always at the, you know, was there an invention in your lifetime that came along that you go, wow, how did we ever get along without that? Surely you remember when the television came on the scene. Well, of course. My daddy had the first television. We had the first television. The boys used to come over on the streetcar from South Dallas. I didn't get that far with you. The AZA boys that lived in Dallas and South Dallas. And they would come over. And they'd come over in the, down the trolley car, the streetcar. And they'd come over on Saturday. My mother would have the delicatessen tray out for all of them to make sandwiches or whatever every Saturday. She knew the boys were coming to see me and to see the television. Why well, is the tell We had the first little television there. That was a really exciting thing. Remember the music you liked when you were a kid? Oh, yes. Yeah. Chitterbug, Samba, Rumba, Cha Cha, Merengue. Are you kidding? I'm a dancer. I'm a ballroom dancer. I never had a lesson. I danced to this day. Are you involved now, actively involved with the uh, Jewish community at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. Big contributor. Big contributor. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I led the Federation Drive, younger set, the new brides and the new the new mothers when they had babies. And my motto was, give me 52 and 62. So it was in 1962. 52 agencies. I'm doing it in 1962. What's easier to ask for? I had 25 vice chairmen I set up underneath me. Each one had to get five people to work for them. Every night they had to call and tell me what pledges they got from each one, whatever. I tripled the amount of money raised to work. I called it my campaign. <laughs> if you want to work in my campaign, it was not my campaign. Of course, it's a federation campaign for 52 agencies. You have to come to my orientation meeting here at the JCC. I will take no, accept no excuses. Not that you're going to the beauty shop, not that your maid didn't come, no excuses. That's if you want to be in it, and, and that's what you have to do to be in it. First time they've ever had 100% participation in a meeting ever, ever here. The whole thing ran. They learned how I wanted it done, how to ask for the pledges, how to be nice and, and you know, congenial and sweet to everybody so that people want to give not only that time, but for years to come. I set it up as it runs today. So you think that's not, that's a big feather in my cap. I'm very, very pleased about that. Now, in your lifetime, you've lived through so many momentous occasions. Vietnam War era, Kennedy assassination here in Dallas, something good, the moon landing for the first time in 60. Lots of stuff, but I wasn't involved in too much of it. It just was astounding to me what you're asking me. I mean, you know, if it's a war, it's earth shattering. Right. If somebody was killed, Kennedy, you know, knocks you off your feet. You can't believe it. You, you remember, can't understand. Do you remember where you were when he was shot? No, well, people always say, I mean, I, I hear them asked on TV, different people. No, I don't remember, probably at home. Yeah. Probably, because I was pretty much kept at home unless they knew I was going to school or dance or something like that. Now, you and Fred had four kids. You lost your daughters. You told us the pancreatic Three cancer. years, uh-huh. Uh, and you have five grandkids. Mm -hmm. 
What advice does Grandma have for the next generation? Well, the thing that bothers me uh, the most it is the drugs and the alcohol and the, the smoking. Now for the high holidays, when we have to have four cups of wine for Passover, uh, I'll take a sip. Yes, I will take that, you know, at the table. But as far as drinking, you want to order wine before your meal at a restaurant? Or do we have wine on the table before dinner? Absolutely not. I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I've never had drugs. I hope that I have children and grandchildren that are not, when I hear it every day, is on every news. Of course, that bothers me tremendously. Thank God they're not on it, but you don't know. You have no idea of knowing with five, you know, four in college out of five, and that the fifth would be getting ready to go, what's going to be? You don't know that. It sounds like you had a great life. I had a great life. I told you the two big things that really will knock your socks off, yes. Will knock you, but you have to overcome it, to have the stamina, to have the strength, to have the fortitude. You no, know, no, God is with you. I'm not a, a very you know, prayerful daily or anything like that, but I go to Temple Emmanuel. I don't go on Friday nights, but I go for the holidays, you know. And uh, I believe in God. And something has to pull you through. Yeah. It has to pull you through. You did a great job today. Thanks for doing this. Oh, you're more than welcome.